Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, cutting college costs? Senator Bob Menendez is co-sponsoring a bill to make community college free across the nation. How would that work with Governor Murphy's plan here in New Jersey? What's a convention of states, and why are some people saying we need it right now? Plus, preserving and presenting artifacts of Newark School's historic past, and a local college club team is making a strike for the history books against the top schools in the nation. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. Should taxpayers foot part of the bill for community college? Governor Murphy's proposed making $45 million in state funds available to help people with tuition payments. Now running for re-election, U.S. Senator Bob Menendez is proposing the federal government contribute too. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan was at the senator's announcement. I believe it's time we make free community college a reality in this country. Senator Bob Menendez addressed a room full of students at Union County College in Elizabeth and outlined a bill he's co-sponsoring that would lift the burden of tuition and fees called the America's College Promise Act. The legislation creates a $3 to 1 federal match for states that make community college tuition free. And we should be on our march to making that happen. Menendez estimated the bill could save a full-time student an average of $3,500 a year in tuition before financial aid even kicks in. He said it's not income-based. Students would just need to live in the county and... They would have to uh, maintain a certain average while they're in school. It's not a free ride. Uh, you got to work for it. The bill could benefit an estimated 9 million full-time American County College students, 150,000 of them here in New Jersey. At UCC, annual tuition and fees cost more than $5,800 a year. Investing in community colleges like UCC is a smart thing to do because they're accountable, they're accredited, and they're responsive to the needs of our diverse community. Our bill would encourage more state to follow New Jersey's lead and make sure students who complete two-year degrees are able to seamlessly transfer to four-year institutions like Rutgers and TCNJ. I like that. I think it's a very good idea. It's about time. Yeah. They invest in students. I mean, and how, how much do, is it costing you? Is it a burden? Yes, because I had to take a loan to cover my books. My parents don't have a good job, so having this opportunity to have money to go to school, it's a really good opportunity. The bill does not have bipartisan support. Free Community College claims a prominent place on progressive Democrats' political agendas. Governor Phil Murphy just proposed spending $45 million as a down payment on his three-year $200 million plan one that state Republicans consider unaffordable. Murphy's undeterred. I'm a big believer that education ought to be a right, not a privilege. But Murphy's plan would provide so-called last dollar grants that cover any costs not already paid by Pell Grants, TAG Awards, or other funding sources. The Menendez bill would require a first dollar investment, aides explained, so that states would cover 25 percent of costs right off the top. So for every dollar that the state would put up, the federal government would put up three. That means that New Jersey taxpayers would ultimately uh, pay less as a result of it. Without commenting on their plan's differences, Murphy's press secretary said the governor applauds Senator Menendez for his work to secure federal funding for New Jersey students. By expanding opportunities for our children to obtain a college education, we create a future where more New Jersey citizens can join the middle class and contribute to our economy. How much will the Menendez bill cost? Unknown at this point. The bill has yet to be scored by the Congressional Budget Office. In Elizabeth, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Now to affordable housing. A year ago today, they broke ground in Woodbridge, and today they went back for the ribbon cutting and the grand opening of Jacob's Landing. 
The new private apartments are replacing public housing, the 64-year-old Woodbridge Garden Apartments. Phase one includes seven buildings. Two have opened with first dibs going to residents from public housing. Five units have been set aside for homeless families. We are putting up new luxury apartments throughout town. There is, I hope all the redevelopers who are putting up these luxury apartments don't get mad at me, but you can't tell the difference. So the people who are living here can be just as happy as everybody else who's going to be renting a new apartment in Woodbridge. The community will also offer social services. A partnership involving the New Jersey Housing and Mortgage Finance Agency will also help build two more phases, 204 units in all. Some relief for Sandy victims still waiting to fortify their homes against the next superstorm. FEMA's agreed to extend for three years a critical flood mitigation program that gives survivors up to $30,000 to help cover the costs of elevating their homes and making their properties more resilient. The program they paid for in their flood insurance policies was scheduled to end this October, but New Jersey's congressional delegation convinced FEMA to extend the deadline. In a unanimous vote, former Assembly member Elizabeth Mayor Moyo has been confirmed as state treasurer, just the second woman in state history to hold the cabinet post. She'll oversee a department with more than 3,000 employees, a nearly $35 billion state budget, and the nearly $78 billion public employee pension system. Moyo's already been heavily involved in the rollout of Governor Murphy's proposed 2019 budget, $2.7 billion bigger than the one adopted during the Christie administration. And she's already adjusted the projected returns on pension investments, reversing a Christie-era decision. Democratic lawmaker Tim Eustace has resigned from the assembly position he's held since 2012 and is moving on to a different position. Starting Monday, he'll be the deputy director of the North Jersey District Water Supply Commission. The Bergen County Democrat is one of only two openly gay members of the legislature. Eustace and his late partner gained national attention back in the late 1980s when they became New Jersey's first openly gay couple to apply for joint adoption. They later adopted three children with AIDS. Ahead of the November elections that could flip control of Congress, one of the nation's races to watch is here. The Cook Political Report rates New Jersey's seventh congressional district race a toss-up. That means a tough campaign ahead for incumbent Republican Congressman Leonard Lance, no matter which of the three Democratic candidates running wins the primary. Tom Malinowski's won the support of all six county Democratic chairs in the district. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron went on the record to find out why Malinowski thinks he has the front uh, runner position and what other candidates make of his lead. I think that's... Uh... A good question to ask all the people who have come out in support of our campaign. We've uh, had uh, pretty open Democratic conventions in um, many of the counties in the district. We have how six counties? counties. You have six, six counties. That's, that's right. A lot. So we have. So how many county lines have you won? Six. You've won all six. That's right. You're yeah. the party endorsed candidate in all six. That's correct. Have you raised more money than either of these gentlemen? Well, quite a bit, yes. <laughs> um, Give us numbers. Well, we're just releasing uh, our numbers uh, today. So in the two quarters that I've been in the race, we've raised just over a million dollars, which is significantly more than Congressman Lance. Peter, what, what's your take on him being the organization-backed candidate and having raised a million dollars? And how much have you raised? Mm -hmm. Tom is a cool guy, without a doubt. I like him. But we're going till June 5th. And the fact of the matter here in the state of New Jersey, we got to be, we got to have a serious conversation about our democracy. In all honesty, when a few establishment folks decide on candidates, that's not a democracy. And that comes way before a June election when the people of the district get to decide. Uh, I think, without a doubt, our campaign, what we are running on, the message we are fighting for is a democracy and an economy that should work for each and every single one of us. I don't prioritize money. 
Uh, I believe in creating an America one day in which your character, your values, the things that you are fighting for, that your vote should matter more than money at the end of That's the day. That's very idealistic. I don't know how realistic that is. Uh, it, all of history de uh, depends on the unreasonable man. That's all progress has been based on. Well, I think uh, you, what you described and what Tom described is accurate, that the Democratic uh, Party establishment in the six counties has gone in that direction. I think the total number of people that have participated in that process, which is you know, a perfectly fine process, but numbers in the hundreds, uh, as opposed to the tens of thousands who are going to make a decision on June 5th. So uh, it's certainly true that, that six county establishments have gone one direction, but I don't think that um, ultimately bears on the decision that the people of the 7th District will make on June 5th. You can watch Michael's entire interview Saturday evening at 6.30 and again Sunday morning at 10.30. Solving two dilemmas with one stroke of the pen. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Little Egg Harbor Township, where the Pinelands Regional School District wants to fill a superintendent vacancy by asking the state to let them share one. The district serves 1,580 middle and high school students from four towns, including Bass River, which is also short a superintendent. The Ocean County superintendent would have to approve the shared services plan before it goes to the state commissioner of education. Pinelands already has service agreements to share IT specialists, a business administrator, and school buses. An email sent to parents suggests by sharing a superintendent, the district could save as much as $800,000 over four years. Next to Newark and an educational treasure trove in search of a home. Annual reports from 1858, meeting minutes written in German from the 1800s, a wooden music stand from Arts High School, 1930s era auditorium chairs from 18th Avenue School, a safety patrol badge from 1916, golf clubs from Behringer High School, a Mark Twain record album, and a school book belonging to Newark's first African-American principal, James Baxter, who presided over the State Street School in 1864. Curators want the nomadic collection to get a permanent home at State Street because the school built in 1845 for quote colored girls is already part of an historical neighborhood but it's now owned by the Newark Housing Authority. The artifacts are on display at the Newark Public Library. Finally, Egg Harbor Township, where family members of those who survived gathered at the Rodef Shalom Cemetery to remember people with South Jersey ties who died during the Holocaust. Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, commemorates the six million Jewish victims of the Holocaust. It started at sundown Wednesday, 10 days after the first night of the Passover Seder, the date linked to April 19, 1943 the start of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in Poland. And that's the Garden State Express for Friday the 13th of April. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. It's not been invoked before, but Article 5 of the United States Constitution provides for states to be a check on the federal government, to reduce federal spending, and even reduce the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. Early steps are already being taken to hold a convention of states. A spokesperson for the project, Dan Gilligan, sat down with Michael Hill. I want to ask you this. How does the convention of states, how does that work? Well, uh, Convention of States is a uh, method by which state legislatures can essentially act as a check uh, on the federal government. Uh, it's constitutionally prescribed in Article 5. And the way that it works is that the states have to agree that they want to have a convention or a meeting about a uniform topic. And our topic or application item is that we seek for the states to get together to have this meeting to discuss ways in which we can reduce federal spending, reduce federal power and jurisdiction, and consideration of term limits at the federal level. So we have that uniform language throughout 
uh, the country in all of the various states. Twelve states have passed that resolution. And the way that it works is that once we get, and this is according to Article 5, uh, following the recipe that's in the Constitution, once we get to that uh, two-thirds threshold of 34, 34. states, mm -hmm. then we simply uh, call a meeting, Michael. You know, we've, we've really done nothing at that point, except we've, we've uh, stated that the states think that they need to get together to consider uh, amendments to the Constitution addressing one or all of these three items. And then, then even though the states who didn't necessarily vote for this, they can still send delegates so you'll have votes from all 50 states. That's absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter which mix of the, you know, two-thirds of the states, everybody is invited to that meeting. And what happens after that? You get to this convention, right. and then you have 50 or, or voting delegates there, yes. and, uh, and how many of those delegates have to vote in order for you to say, okay, this resolution is adopted, this resolution is adopted, and we can move forward? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it will be um, quite a, uh, an amazing exercise once we get all of these states together to consider um, amendments to these three application items. And the way that it works is that the states will determine um, which commissioners, as they refer to them, they will send as their representatives. And uh, they, each state, while they're there, will get one vote. So in order for something to come out of there, it simply has to be a majority, okay, okay. of the 50 states. Okay. Um, and that, I think, really, Michael, is kind of the easy part. Um, this was set up so that the states could use their constitutional authority that's granted to them to act as a check on the federal government. It's never been done before. And many people think that, you know, part of the reason why we have the uh, condition of the federal government that we do now, you know, the $20 trillion in debt, the $100 trillion, and that's why I'm involved as a volunteer. I'm, I, I just see the trajectory of, of the country from a financial perspective to, you know, not be uh, good. So, um, you know, that was set up uh, in the Constitution. Uh, the states having this authority to act as a check on the federal government. And once you, once you vote, say the vote in, 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 on some of these uh, resolution items, 26 to 24, that's the majority that you talk about. Right. What happens after that? Is it still up to Congress to do something, or can the states vote to say, we're amending the Constitution? The, frankly, the, 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 it's the latter. And the beauty of this, and what makes it very attractive and really rather you know, elegant and powerful, is that once um, that convention takes place, uh, this is something that is autonomously run by the states, and it was designed so that neither the federal government, so that neither the Congress, the executive, or the judiciary could um, have input to this. And the reason is because this part of Article 5 was really, uh, we think, set there with the expectation that, Cong that the federal government would simply start to do more than it was ever uh, intended to do. So the states are unique in actors across government because it is the states, and, and, and we don't realize how powerful the states are, but it is the states only who can actually amend the Constitution all by themselves uh, with no, you know, Congress, Congress can start it, you need, they need the states to ratify. Yeah. The judiciary can't do it, the executive can't do it, but the states can do it all by themselves. So whatever comes out of this meeting of the, uh, the, at the convention of states, um, and as you say, you know, they, they vote on it, everybody um, uh, votes, and whatever work product essentially comes out of that, then what happens is it gets approved by the states. But these gentlemen, a couple hundred years ago, thought this through very well. It doesn't get just, just approved by a majority of the states, or even by uh, two-thirds of the states, the 34 that was needed to call the meeting. It has to get approved by three-quarters. So very, very hard to do, but you know what? We're doing something very big, something very powerful and important, and it shouldn't be easy. So. How far along are you in this process? Twelve states now have voted, nine houses in these individual states. Mm -hmm. um, how far along are you? Well, um, I, as a volunteer, have been working with Convention of States for about two years. We've been in business, so to speak, as a, as a project for approximately four years. Um, uh, we have uh, over three million supporters, people who've signed the petition right. across the country. We have the 12 states. We are active in 50 states. Um, from what I understand, as, and I'm an amateur uh, rookie at this stuff, but um, for a grassroots organization, our uh, growth and success has been really impressively rapid. How about New Jersey? Where does New Jersey stand with this? Well, uh, in New Jersey, we have over 17,000 people who signed the petition. Um, we have a, a great leadership team. We have guys like Gary and Bills and Trenton today, very active people. Uh, we have over 1,000 people who've indicated that they'll volunteer with us in some way. We really have probably about 25 people who are spending a fair amount of time uh, doing this. We have a, 
uh, concurrent resolution in the New Jersey State House. We have some um, sponsors who are very, uh, you know, supportive and passionate about uh, trying to get this done. Dan, let me ask you this question. This is essential because people listening to this will say, okay, if Congress can do this, why do we need a convention of the states? Let me be blunt. Sure. This effort doesn't trust Congress. This effort doesn't think Congress has the will to get done what you want done? Now, you're, you're exactly correct, and that doesn't make Congress bad. Um, this was anticipated by the founders. Remember, you know, the Constitution is a very, very cogent document. There's eight articles in the Constitution, one of which is where they just all sign their name and say, yeah, you know, we, we approve this. So Article 5 um, exists there for, uh, for a reason. And the reason was that just how we have that same system of checks and balances, Michael, that we're very familiar with at the right. federal level between the uh, executive, the judiciary, and uh, Congress, there was intended to be that same dynamic between the states and the federal government. To rein in the federal government. To act as a check and help the federal government not get off the rails. So, you know, for, for example, um, the, the checks and balances exist between Congress and uh, the president, the president and Congress. For example, the president has the veto power. Well, where would we be if the president simply never used that right. and he was really just a figurehead and powerless? Well, it's analogous to where the states are at. We haven't used this tool that it's interesting, you know, uh, people have posited that if uh, you were to tell uh, Thomas Jefferson and George Mason that, hey, you know, um, this has never been used, they'd say, well, guys, what are you dealing with? You know, it's, it, things must not be too good. And, you know, I think, I think they, they may have been right about that. So. Interesting stuff. Dan Gilligan there with the Convention of the States. Dan, we'll be checking with you again on this topic to see how this is going along. Uh, uh, Thank you we, very much. Wonderful. Good to be with you, Michael. Best bowlers are headed to the Men's Collegiate National Championships. That's the highest title you can get at that level. And a small club team from North Jersey is the one with strikes to spare. Leia Mishkin reports from Lodi. What is that, strike number 10 for the day? Give or take. Plus or minus one. <laughs> so you're the team captain? Yeah. The season's been good. Um, hoping to go out my senior year, like, with a win. We are William Patterson bowling, and we are going to nationals. <laughs> All right, we do it once more. It's a little more enthusiastic. <laughs> oh, I was going to say that. Third time in the charm. We were in Baton Rouge last year, Louisiana. Made a pretty decent run, came in fifth. The year before, we uh, came in second. So this year, we're trying to go for it all. Here, what I see is a lot of hunger. The guys that want to get back there, they want to win. Whoa. Good job, Brandon. It's a club sport. Yeah, it's, it's a club sport. I mean, so you're playing Division One school. Yeah, we we play. We'll bowl against you know Arizona State. We go against Notre Dame College, just all the big schools. A couple years ago, we, I would consider us an underdog, and that's not the case anymore. Four years of uh, great coaching helps a bunch. The field is very competitive. Is that rare for a, cl a club team to go that far? Uh, yes. They just make it look easy. Pointing out little things, is that how it works? Yeah, just small mechanical, um, <clears throat> mechanical technique things. I've been involved in bowling over 55 years, yes. I was a former professional bowler, coaching them for the last three or four years. We've refined them, that little bit more understanding of what they're looking for, and the team really works together very well. And we have all the resources, we have the best equipment, Ebonite bowling balls. Uh, best coaching staff, players are looking sharp, so we're really going for it. I'll work with them, especially when they're practicing. Sometimes we're here, one o'clock, two o'clock, 
and they're still bowling. Really? In the morning. That's in the morning. That's why, you know what, we support them here 100%. Yeah, we'll put all the TVs that we have all over. Everybody be watching. We're, we're best friends bowling on a national winning team, and it's amazing to see it. We are William Patterson Bowling, and we're going to nationals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And now some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. Elizabeth Mayor Moyo is just the second woman ever to serve as New Jersey state treasurer. Tim Eustace is the second on openly gay person to ever serve in the New Jersey legislature. There are 19 community colleges in New Jersey, and the William Patterson University bowling team has qualified for the national championships 14 times. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thanks for being here. Enjoy spring. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association.